What we do now is, as you all know, you've all been in workshops for the last two days, and you've had three great sessions of uh, kicking around lots of ideas on five very, very important topics. So now we're going to have some of the facilitators of those sessions come up and just give a few minutes of a summary so that everybody can hear a little bit about what they were talking about, uh, what they learned, and what the next steps are for the uh, issues and questions and, uh, and efforts that they were discussing. So we're going to start off with workshop A, and that's strategies for improving sustainability. And uh, Roger Worthington, uh, who's a HESI uh, SDG Publishers Compact Fellow, is going to be reporting for workshop A. Thank you, Phil. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we had uh, some very, very good quality discussion, very intensive uh, discussion, uh, focusing on two main themes. Uh, one was about uh, improving alignment for the sustainability goals in relation to publishing and SDG research. And the other theme was about knowledge sharing for the SDGs. So we've, I've just got two slides. And uh, so the, we, we identified three three principal um, points that we wanted to, to bring home. Um, one is the, the importance or the value of, of building a virtual community so that uh, the SDG Fellows, which is a group of about 20 people from, uh, drawn from um, publishers, academia, um, and uh, librarians, uh, different, different communities within the, the publishing ecosystem, if you like, uh, to build a virtual community so that we can share best practice. And we're starting to build a portfolio of, of case examples where um, publishers and other organizations are, are, have already got good policies and practice in place for promoting sustainable development goals. So that's the first, um, perhaps you know, one, one of the most valuable things. Um, another idea that came up during the workshop was uh, there might be value in, in providing some guidelines so that publishers and other organizations who might need a bit of help or advice or wondering where to go to to help them to do this better um, and uh, so to address things like eth uh, ethical concerns, uh, equity issues, um, and also uh, uniform tagging of relevant context, such as um, a, a taxonomy. Um, and this is quite a complex task. We've already started working on it, and other organizations are also working on it. So this is more to do on that, um, but there should be value in that. Um, the old adage of follow the money, um, so focus on, on funders. Um, because if you can help to motivate uh, researchers, um, it might help to promote more SDG research and to make their research more, um, uh, more transparent. Um, and, um, and part of that has to do with motivating in the individuals concerned and getting, getting rewards, because sometimes within applied research, the, the system for um, um, rewarding researchers is perhaps not the same as it is for other types of research. And so it's important to be able to align um, SDG work um, and to consider the outcomes of that work um, and the impact it has on society. Uh, we came up with a couple of other suggestions, which I'm hoping, okay, if I press the right button, that'll work. Um, and that is, um, there might be benefit in having some tools for policymakers. Um, both at high level, um, in other words, macro policy decision making, which might even be at government level, as well as internally and within organizations. Promoting SDG research needs to be done um, at all these levels. It's not enough just to, to work at, at, at one level and, and hope that it will transform the culture. And so leading on from that, uh, promoting action to uh, um, better, to work more closely towards fulfillment of the SDG goals, it needs um, a bottom-up as well as a top-down approach within organizations, and that involves strategic thinking and actively involving um, members of staff within that organization. Because uh, a couple of people came up and said, well, they didn't really know if there was an SCG lead. They weren't sure if the publisher group had signed the compact, for instance. Um, I won't go into the compact itself now, but um, uh, let's move. So in terms of the second, uh, uh, area that we were looking on about knowledge sharing and strategies for improving sustainability. Um, these are the three key findings that we came up with. Uh, one of which was a really interesting idea which I didn't know anything about until this morning. Um, and there is a movement which I believe is uh, being promoted by its mayors in some major cities 
um, to engage in a practice for 24-hour climate change science day to promote local science and community action. So it would start and work, perhaps in Australia or something, work its way around the, around the globe with continuous activity. And I think that's a wonderful way of, of uh, promoting awareness um, of um, uh, SDGs relating to, to climate. And I'm sure that would attract quite a lot of media attention. Uh, the next one is to uh, improve communication in terms of the real world applications of SDGs. Um, so that um, people can identify relevant uh, research that is relevant to their fields of activity and, re and research, um, and that may be through blogs or, or other, other methods of communication. Um, and the other thing that came out very clearly from the discussions is that it is not going to work in terms of promoting sustainable development if people think and operate within their individual silos. Um, it, this has to be across disciplines, um, so it needs an interdisciplinary and, and a multidisciplinary approach towards research to help um, push this agenda forward. Um, and then the couple of other points that we thought of, um, there are some issues, uh, or that the groups fed back on, um, there are some issues sometimes of the erosion of trust in science, which some people will, will resonate with, um, and, um, and that there would be value in helping to equip researchers to identify them, to, uh, to help them identify misinformation or disinformation. Um, and also, um, it would be beneficial to improve incentives to uh, share SCG research. Um, and that means incorporating the metrics into research assessments for higher education institutions themselves as well as metrics that are associated with individuals, individual researchers, and their career progression. So that's just a summary of, of the, the, the discussions that we had. And I don't think we're taking questions, are we? Where's Phil? So well, shall I? In the interest of time, if there are questions, if we do have enough time at the end of the session, we can do them then. OK, fine. Right, does that make Thank sense? you. OK, so uh, thanks very much uh, for that, Roger. So uh, hopefully that uh, was very informative for everybody and, you'd, and it uh, started your brains whirring. I like the idea of a 24-hour SDG day. I think the last uh, Pitapalooza I went to was a 24-hour conference, and for at least one person it was a matter of pride to go to the whole thing. So apparently that was quite tiring. So the next one, workshop B, was open access requirements for books. And uh, Mitty Lucraft and uh, Ross Pine are going to... Uh, report on behalf of that on, uh, and they're from, uh, Mitu is from TBI Communications and Ross is from Bloomsbury. So, yeah, yeah. so four years ago we held a workshop here about how we, can, how we could do more open access for books and the outcome of that was an open access books toolkit with a sort of primer for authors. Four years later we're back and we're talking about supporting authors with requirements to open access for books and that's because OA for Books has accelerated massively with funders in the UK, the US and across Europe all having an increased interest in um, incentivizing or requiring their authors to publish books OA. So it's a really fast changing landscape. Um, we looked at pain points and we found that there's still pretty low familiarity with OA amongst book authors who tend to be more often situated amongst the humanities and social sciences. We looked at three different stages of the publication cycle, so pre-submission when authors are planning their books. Um, there's a low understanding about OA which might mean about different types of open access, open access licensing, what the benefits might be. But there's also a low understanding of how to do open access. What are the funding sources? How might you apply for them in practice? What does my funder require and what does that mean? What book is, it, you know, which books are in scope of policies? How do I negotiate a contract with my publisher that enables me to do what I need to do? And one thing that also came up a lot was is there enough money in the system and do we have the right models to enable us to flip equitably? We then looked at during submission, so the publisher has the proposal or the book manuscript and they are working through the process of reviewing and publishing it um, in contact with the author. Many publishers still have legacy systems that are poorly adapted for open access books. There's a lot of manual workarounds going on, a lot of admin. Third party rights has always comes up with OA books, but we still haven't fixed it. And it does mean authors are going out trying to secure third party rights in a different context. Uh, they don't necessarily know how to answer all of those questions and they don't, there aren't good resources. 
and VAT applies to OA fees, as I'm sure many OA journal publishers will be aware. But this is also an issue for books, and this means that if you're trying to flip subscription revenue, which is not subject to VAT, suddenly OA costs an awful lot more. Then we looked at after publication. So the funder has a policy you need to comply, but who's actually in charge of that? Where does that responsibility sit? Has that been clearly demarcated? Have people taken ownership of it? Are they the right people? I think we need more conversation to make sure that that is clear. Felt that authors didn't necessarily have a great understanding of uses, of metrics. How do you measure value? What does it, what does it mean? Um, to what does this number attached to my book mean? Is it even a good idea to have all of these numbers? What, how can we kind of create more nuance and more understanding about these metrics? Um, how can we support authors in promoting their books? That's not to suggest that's the only promotion that should happen for these books, but it can be really powerful. And if we can help to support authors in doing that, they might feel more comfortable. And we also talked about post-publication flips. So the book is initially published not as OA, and it's flipped afterwards. And because of the costs involved in OA books, that's becoming an interesting model, but it's a lot of complication. So we did conclude that we needed better and more visible OA resources for authors to build out what we had. But we also really need to reduce the burden on authors. How do we make it easier for authors we try and find those pain points and we automate as much as we can. We find, meta, you know, we find metadata-driven solutions. Uh, we find industry, uh, you know, we collaborate between publishers and funders and librarians so that authors can focus on doing their research and publishing their books. So, I can hand it over to Mitu. Thanks, Roz. And as Roz started, this, this was really an opportunity to be very action-orientated and think about what do we do four years on from having come together and created a resource. So what we want to do is start by sharing an update on our findings. And we will be using the R2R forum, so please feel free to join us there to see a summary of what we've put together. We're going to be looking at how can we update existing resources. And, and Ros has mentioned the Open Access Books Toolkit that came out of the R2R conference. And we're going to be sharing that summary back into the OA Books Toolkit board and to UKRI and to JISC and to others who we know are, are interested in, in, in what the gaps are that we've identified for authors and the potential opportunities to improve the resources that our author facing. We want to make sure that the guides that get produced remain agnostics and that's about pooling resources. So it's not necessarily about creating new, it's about identifying where there are gaps and looking for solutions that exist and creating one centralized point where authors can find information about contracts, licensing, how content's being used, how they can promote their content, and all of those other pain points which came up. A very creative idea that came out of the workshop, and uh, I'm encouraging Claire Redhead to take this forward for OASPA, is a film on the OA Books Toolkit, which we can, we can premiere at OASPA in, in September. I leave that out there for anyone who has video skills to, to come back on and, and, and see, is there, is there something there? Um, but that, that was definitely one of the more creative ways of thinking about how do we really engage authors on what they need to know and get that earlier in the process. Third, VAT. Uh, OASPA is already in the process of lobbying to see if the 20% VAT on open access costs can be removed. Uh, I think there were other pr pr projects underway on, on that score um, that were mentioned in the group, so that's certainly something that's, that's ongoing and needs to continue. And then we hope that we can actually move some of these gaps forward. So we want to continue this, the discussion. So as I've mentioned, the R2R forum will be a venue for us to continue that. Whether you are in our working group or not, if you have an interest in open access books and would like to help move that discussion forward, if you have access to resources that you feel could be appropriate here to help authors understand the value and what they need to know, please get involved. Um, we're also considering, and this came up in the group, whether there is more needed in terms of understanding author views. There has obviously been market research in this area, but has that changed? Is there a shift in what authors are expecting? So a chance to, to look at that, perhaps a, uh, via a survey, is certainly worth considering and looking at what their concerns are, specifically around things like royalties, reuse, formats of the books. Do they still care about print? We suspect they do from, from our workshop, but all of these are under consideration. I think that's us. Excellent. Thank you. 
Thanks very much. One of the things that I really like about the R2R workshops is how we manage to generate some really solid actionable outputs from them. And I think that's a, a really unique thing for, uh, for conference conversations uh, to be really actionable. So, and I think the, um, yeah, the OA for Books um, workshop is uh, one, of the, one of the best examples of that. So I think that's a really good job. And uh, Mark will uh, no doubt like me to say that please do uh, participate in the R2R forum and continue the conversation uh, there. He's, uh, he's very keen that folks uh, join that, so please, uh, so please uh, do that. Um, so the next one, Workshop C, was Bridging the Funder Gap, and we have Kirsty Merritt to report on that from the University of Bristol. This is one of those moments where I think, what did I write in these slides not very long ago? Um, so some time ago, 2019, I started um, at uh, Fair Day Today in Helsinki, and we were discussing the issues with uh, data access, data sharing statements in journal articles. And so moving on from that last year, we did some more work about data sharing generally, and this is part of the same program that we've been um, engaged in for the last two, three years. So we wanted to make sure that we had a conversation with funders, institutions, intermediaries, and publishers to make sure that we can try and sort the problem out of making data more available and making sure that it's available fairly and making sure that every voice counts. So it was quite an interesting debate that we had in our workshop. Um, the main thing that we pulled out of this is that there seems to be a lack of understanding of each of those stakeholders' parameters by the other stakeholders. So everyone has a different idea about who is responsible and who's going to be able to change this. And our aim was by bringing stakeholders together that we could collaborate and provide some workable and reasonable solutions for the current ecosystem. Um, because we are aware that obviously we're working within specific um, boundaries in terms of businesses and institutions and funders. So we worked in small groups to provide those suggestions um, and then after we'd come up with a list of the top 10 on each of our tables, individuals were able to then rank those recommendations based on their standpoint. Now that standpoint could be how passionate they are about research data or it could be how realistic they are about their business uh, model. So if you look at, for example, the first five here, we have uh, data access statements and DOI checkings as part of the publishing process. That's very much in the publisher's um, area. And then we have um, alignment of uh, an exposure of data management policies by funders. So that's something that the funders could be responsible for. And then also ensuring that there's enough adequate funding to provide the infrastructure for um, researchers to understand how to do research data management and how to publish their data. So we, um, we've, from that, we've ended up with a, a list of recommendations. And we've also ended up with, just at the last minute, said, how do people feel about this? And there was lots of kind of confusion, and people were worried and concerned. And then as you watch the word cloud grow, you realize that actually there were some people that were saying, this is actually, I'm a bit curious about this. Oh, I'm a bit challenged. I don't know. Uh, this is something that I hadn't thought of before. So we're definitely very, very confident that out of this, we would at least be able to um, make sure that that conversation is happening and people are aware of the need and that we all need to pull together to resolve this situation. So as I said, this is part of this two-year program of engagement across the community to come up with these workable solutions to increase the availability of fair data. We are going to produce um, an open access article that's a summary of those um, pieces of work that we've done, of course, with supporting data. Um, and uh, Lou Peck um, of the International Bunch will be providing that. If you would like to subscribe to her newsletter, we'll be able to send you an alert when that article is published. And uh, that's it from me. Thanks very much, Kirsty. Uh, I think uh, we'll all agree that was an excellent uh, a couple of days of workshops and, uh, and um, some really interesting uh, findings and, and, and ideas to move forward with that. So next one, uh, workshop D, is research integrity tools. And this is going to be Ed Gernstein from Springer Nature who's going to tell us about that. Thanks. I also am going to try and remember what it was that I wrote down on these slides just half an hour ago. Well, it was an hour ago. Um, so we were talking about, we had a really active, engaged group of people who were talking about the question is, what research integrity training do researchers need? And is there a, is there a demand for community-led, community-driven, community-developed toolkit 
for meeting the demands of, 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 of researchers in terms of training. Still up, okay. So we, we began by asking questions. My favorite question, actually the question that I, 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 I intended to be a bit controversial was, should professors carry the can for poor integrity in the groups that they lead? I think this would work. Because so many, in, in, in my personal experience, I've found that a lot of the failings in research integrity have come from groups where the person in charge hasn't been paying attention to what his or her people have been doing in the lab. They've been happy to take credit for all the great work, for all the papers, for all the accolades, for all the triumphs. But as soon as something goes wrong, they run a mile. Um, and I think that's because they're not paying attention enough. Um, but this is a way of going into the question, who needs research integrity training? What are those needs? Uh, what should the training look like? Um, and does the world need community-led training support? So many of the answers that we got from our energized group of, of attendees. Uh, in practice, uh, many researchers rely on their peers. Um, and maybe we should try and uh, build on that fact, build on rather than uh, toolkits from funders or institutions or uh, uh, publishers even. Uh, is there a way that we could uh, uh, expand on the peer-led advice uh, that we get? Uh, it was pointed out that researchers need feedback, not, not gotcha checks. They, when it, if problems are found at the point of publication, that's way too late. It's too late for people to learn to do better, and it's too late for us to prevent those problems from happening. So does the world need a toolkit? Uh, the overwhelming uh, 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 opinion from the room was that yes. But first, it was, it was pointed out that we need to make sure that we all agree on the standards. What does research integrity mean? What does it look like? What does best practice look like? And of course, that will change depending on the con context. It'll change from field to field, um, probably from country to country. And we need, if we agree, once we agree on these standards, we make sure, we'll make sure that someone writes them down and distributes them and puts them somewhere where, where other people can access them and can find them. Um, uh, uh, another, actually, another. Um, I wanted to add another. Another interesting. So ne next, I'm going to. We had this idea of the stinking fish, um, and there were lots of stinking fish in in this session. Um, uh, before I get to the stinking fish, one of the, one of my favourite suggestions was that uh, when should to, to the question, who does who needs training in research integrity? Uh, one, one one of the people said, high school. No, primary school. If primary school children understood the fundamentals of research integrity, or rather, if they better understood the practice of research, they would be better prepared for understanding research integrity. If everyone understood research integrity because they got it at primary school, maybe there would be less problems. Anyway, the stinking fish. Poor behavior is driven by poor incentives or perverse incentives. Good behavior is driven by no incentives. Surely that's a fundamental problem. If there's no reason to exercise good integrity, there's no reason to exercise good integrity. And the incentives, particularly to publish, the pressures to publish, lots and often are driving bad behavior. Maybe we should talk more about those incentives. Um, and I think there are lots of places, there are lots of fundamental places where we need to begin. And I think training is part of that conversation, but it can't be the whole part of the conversation. It can't just be about training. It has to be about making sure we are motivating good behavior, making sure that we promote a good research culture. Research culture was another one of the uh, issues that was brought up. Um, and again, the research culture, how do we change the research culture? I think that also is related to incentives. Um, and so working on this is the thing that we'll be thinking about that many of the people uh, in the group will be individually thinking about uh, when they go home and leave this conference. Um, and hopefully we'll make a world better place. I think that was the last one. Yes, thank you.
Thanks, Ed. That was great. I think there's a really interesting conversation, isn't there, there about the uh, about the intersection of training and culture change and enforcement and openness and how you and how you sort of thread that needle and uh, and, and improve the environment as a as a whole. So now we're going to become aggressively hybrid again, and uh, the last uh, workshop is uh, challenges in supporting inclusion and Shana Lang is going to be presenting the findings and she's connecting remotely. Um, I think you're in Ohio, aren't you? Thank you, Bill. Yep, I'm in Ohio. It's a very rainy day here. So I hope you all are having better weather where you are. Um, so thank you. I, I have the uh, privilege of summarizing on behalf of a, also a very engaged group uh, over the last two days in Workshop E. And our overarching topic was around how to inclusively approach diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in a sustainable and scalable way without creating additional burden on the very people who are already facing these challenges. Um, we started with a role-playing scenario um, and very award-worthy acting, if I may say so, um, where we questioned assumptions and motivations of key stakeholders that included affected individuals, allies, managers, leaders, um, and that required some reflections on, I think, where we are all uh, individually and, and institutionally in our DEIA journeys. Uh, we then used that scenario to explore some uh, not so small organizational approaches, each of which come with their own challenges. Um, and the ones that we identified were around, how do you secure organizational and leadership support? How can we truly understand the scope and the extent of issues given sometimes uh, power dynamics and other imbalances that are often at play? How do we equip and empower uh, and encourage allies to make courageous decisions? And how do we effectively mark and measure long-term culture change? Um, I will should note that most of our conversations focused internally within our own uh, roles, our own organizations, but we recognize that many of the themes may extend to larger issues around DEIA within uh, research and scholarly communications. Uh, if I could get the next slide, please. So an overarching theme that arose was how to create and maintain an infrastructure that supports long-term change. Uh, so we outlined some reasonable steps that an organization can take towards achieving that. Um, one is ensuring diversity at all levels of the organization. And this is, of course, easier to say than it is to do. Um, but we want to ensure that this isn't a check the box activity. To do this properly, this can require major adjustments to recruiting and promotion practices, a deliberate attempt to be inclusive in hiring, um, onboarding, and retention practices. Uh, regular data collection and reporting is also very crucial to understanding the barriers and the challenges, um, also influencing leadership uh, to dedicate resources to these types of efforts to measure progress along the way. Um, and so we briefly developed some best practices for approaching data collection, uh, which are outlined here. And of course, it depends on the goals of an, of an organization, um, but we mentioned some specific metrics um, here as well, including self-reported demographic data, cultural markers, uh, professional development and retention markers. Um, additionally, supporting and training uh, for allies and individuals from marginalized communities. Um, we had a lot of discussions around how these communities are not uh, monolithic, they have distinct needs and identities, and so organizations can recognize that and support those communities accordingly. Um, that can include having dedicated champions uh, who can maybe help drive forward efforts and advocate for a specific community. Um, that can also include offering safe spaces for those groups to share openly. Uh, employee resource groups or ERGs, um, listening sessions, if done properly, are really great venues uh, to uh, facilitate these types of conversations. Also providing mentorship and career development opportunities. Um, you know, I'm sure this is something that, that all organizations strive for. Particularly those from marginalized communities um, can be less likely to have mentors or, or pass for advancement. Last but not least, um, how can we empower each other and empower allies? Uh, we should be recognizing and promoting those who are modeling positive change, demonstrating great business leadership, and also equipping ourselves and our teams with training. Um, the key thread here that came up is around manageable training, um, not five, six hours of training on, on a dedicated topic, but 20 minutes or 30 minutes here and there, um, incorporating these topics into existing training at various stages, such as uh, onboarding, or if you're a hiring manager for the first time, when you become a new manager. Um, and then I think we all found that uh, through workshops like these, we, we all care about these things and we can all learn from each other. Um, and so we really encourage knowledge sharing 
um, especially with organizations who maybe have more resources in this area or are one step ahead of others. Um, so we're not reinventing the wheel. Um, we thought uh, organization level mentoring on topics like this uh, could also be uh, an outlet for tackling these challenges together and doing some of that knowledge sharing. Um, pictured on this slide here, uh, too, is a screenshot of our mirror board from the first session. Um, I don't expect you to read it necessarily, uh, but I, I have been told that the screen in person is quite large, so uh, maybe you can. Uh, but just to give you a sense of, of how our workshop worked. And if I could get the last slide, please. Great. Um, and so pictured on this slide as well are our two Miro screenshots from our second and third sessions. Um, some final takeaways and, and next steps. I won't run through all of these here, but do want to highlight a couple of takeaways that I think really resonated with our group. Um, and one is the, the power of vulnerability and honesty um, that can apply to an individual and understanding the influence that they have over a situation or an initiative. Um, it can also apply to an organization as they approach things like data collection. Um, they take an honest look at the current state of, of their organization and where they want to go. Um, the other thing I'll highlight is around uh, focusing on incremental and actionable progress. Um, each of the recommendations that we outlined come with their own complexities. They require resources and time that many of us just don't have. Um, and none of these can be addressed overnight or, or even within months or years. And so managing expectations a bit that we are talking about major cultural and social shifts, and that's going to take time. Um, in terms of next steps, um, I think we all have things that we want to take back to our own organizations and our own roles, uh, but we do see a need to continue the conversation. Uh, we had some participants who are also involved in um, cross organizational efforts like c for disc um, the multi-publisher joint commitment. So those might be appropriate venues to, to continue that knowledge sharing, um, promote um, information sharing and, and continue this conversation. Um, c for disc as well has some wonderful resources that are uh, freely available around topics like this for organizations who are uh, early in their journeys. Um, and because much of our conversation centered around data collection, one specific action item that we'd like to take forward is creating a list of recommended metrics that an organization can track and possibly pulling uh, together best practices uh, around that. Um, I think that probably wraps it up for me. Just wanna say a big thank you to all the participants in workshop E and uh, my, my fellow co-organizers and facilitators. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. We've been doing uh, workshops on DEI at uh, R2R for, uh, for quite a long time now. It's really good to see how things have matured, how the conversation has, has moved from um, the exploration of the issues to more concrete and actionable um, approaches. So this is really good work and it's really, it's really exciting to see. Um, so unfortunately, there will not be time for any questions. I think Mark might shoot me if I did allow any. But, if you, uh, but I do encourage you all, we do all encourage you all to continue these conversations. There's the R2R forum and also, of course, the, the speakers and the other facilitators and workshop attendees will all be downstairs um, you know, uh, later for, uh, for drinks or for scholarly social, which is another excellent uh, opportunity to continue these conversations. Uh, so it only remains, uh, before I hand over to the last panel of of the day, um, which Jane Marks will be uh, moderating. It only remains to ask me to thank the uh, ask you all to thank the speakers once again, and uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you.